Wow. Hey, much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in once again. Appreciate you taking the time to do that. Hope you guys liked the life earlier. Yeah, we're just going to keep it going. Why not? Got plenty of time here. And uh, you know me, I got to stay productive. <laughs> We're going to take it one day at a time, though. You know you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, we're just going to re real quick go into uh, this old documentary. Uh, it's called Our Neighbors, The Narragansett. And, uh, you know, this is for uh, fair use. This is for education and commentary, you know, purposes. You know, we're just trying to uh, have their story never forgotten and remembered and keep reminding people of what has happened to uh, different uh, groups, uh, nations uh, in the Americas. Then uh, this is one of them, the Narragansett Indians. All right. So shout out to everybody from New England. You know, I've been to uh, Rhode Island a lot. I've been, you know, again, I grew up in uh, Massachusetts, in Beantown. I've been all over New England. So I understand. I never knew this when I was living there growing up, all this history. But it's uh, amazing. Uh, you know, know this now. And uh, thanks to everybody that's tuned in in the chat. Appreciate you guys. We're going to get started right away. Uh, right into the uh, old documentary first. And then we're going to go uh, into some other information. You know, a little bonus. We're going to do a little bonus today. All right. But let's start out with this uh, documentary first. We're going to go back, you know, back into the old TVs and everything. All right. Remember when we had to get up and switch channels? You guys remember that? Yeah. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> All right. Wow, wow, here we go. It was not we who made war upon the English, but the English who without notice made war upon us, Canonicus, or against etc. Now don't forget, you're talking Indian things here. I want to make it clear as I've tried to qualify the call. When we go out there on the street, the law of the land applies to everyone. You, me, and everyone, and it has to be respected. I've never deviated from that. Never. And I never will. But when you talk about Indian things, and, and the history of what's happened to my people, as opposed to uh, including why it happened, and as opposed to some of our, our attitudes, then you have to understand this long history on this. The first recorded contact between the Narragansett and the European explorers took place in 1524. The people are the most viewed, have the most civil customs that we have found on this voyage. They are taller than we are, the face is clear cut, the eyes are black and alert, and their manner is sweet and gentle. Giovanni de Verrazzano. Nearly a century later, the Chacoquac, or swordmen, landed in Plymouth and began to claim the land as their own. In 1636, Roger Williams, a political outcast from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, arrived in Narragansett territory. According to legend, he was greeted by the Narragansett with the words, What cheer, Nita, the Narragansett word for friend. This historic meeting has inspired stories, paintings, and even a silent film. Roger Williams was one of the few colonists who believed that the Native Americans were the rightful owners of the New World. He criticized those Christians who felt they had a God-given right to seize what they called heathen lands. As more settlers arrived, anger at the intruders grew stronger. Hostilities which had simmered for decades erupted in June of 1675 
War broke out between the Wampanoag and the United Colonies of Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth, Connecticut, and New Haven. To finance the campaign, captured Wampanoag were sold into slavery and shipped to the West Indies. Some fled to Rhode Island, which had vowed to remain neutral. But the English ordered the Narragansett sachem Kananchet to turn over all refugees. No, he told them. Not a Wampanoag, nor the paring of a Wampanoag's nail. The United Colonies declared war on the Narragansetts and sent an army into southern Rhode Island. The troops struggled through an area called the Great Swamp till they reached the hidden stronghold of the Narragansett. The soldiers overcame the defenders and stormed the fortified island that served as a refuge for hundreds of women, children, and old men. Once inside, they quickly put the wigwams to the torch. The shrieks and cries of the women and children, the yelling of the warriors, exhibited a most horrible and appalling scene, so that it greatly moved some of the soldiers. They were in much doubt, and they afterwards seriously inquired whether burning their enemies alive could be consistent with humanity and the benevolent principle of the gospel. The Reverend William Ruggles. Oh, I think it was a massacre. You know, I don't think there can be any question about that because the English troops went much further than they had to do to take that place, to take that land. They didn't have to torch the wee mobs. They didn't have to kill the women and children. So I think in that regard, it was a massacre. Those who survived the slaughter attacked the towns of Warwick, Seekonk, and Providence, burning houses and often killing the inhabitants. In April of 1676, the colonial army captured Kanonchet and immediately sentenced him to be executed. I like it well, he told these captors. I shall die before my heart is soft, or I have said anything unworthy of myself. The great sachem was shot, his body hacked into quarters, and his severed head put on public display. When the war ended, the remaining Narragansetts merged with the Niantic, settling in the area now called Charlestown. The Rhode Island colony assumed jurisdiction over all native territory within its boundaries. The Narragansett nation was eventually squeezed into a 30 square mile tract of land. Over the next hundred years, this domain was further reduced as sachems, in collusion with Rhode Island legislators, sold Narragansett land to pay off personal debts. By the late 19th century, pressure to be assimilated into the cultural mainstream was being brought to bear on Native Americans across the country. In 1879, the state of Rhode Island initiated a proposal to sell off the Narragansett's remaining land and officially abolish the nation. After conducting hearings, a commission determined that 324 men, women, and children could claim tribal membership. Each individual was given $16.56 as a payment for their share of the land. All the tribal people did not agree because that they got a member who thought or they agreed and they did have a couple of the tribal leaders, but not all of them. Uh, this was done, but the thing is that all of us have suffered because of that. But it was not a unanimous decision and it did not follow the tribal procedure at that time. So every law was broken and it still is not accepted as of today. On August 20th, 1883, the state officially concluded the detribalization of the Narragansett Nation with a public ceremony at Fort Nineveh. The centerpiece of the event was a stone taken from the reservation bearing the words, Memorial of the Narragansett Indians, the unwavering friends and allies of our fathers. Governor Augustus Bourne addressed the crowd. I trust that as enduring as this granite may be the recollection in the minds of the people of Rhode Island of the debt of gratitude which they owe to the Narragansett Indians. Governor Augustus Bourne. Neither the monument nor the illegal actions of the state would withstand the test of time. The Narragansetts continued to make their presence known. Some chose to join the ranks of modern society. Others believed that assimilation could only lead to ruin. By then, there were people who knew it, the, uh, the game had long since become familiar with the uh, game that was being played. 
the Narragansett families who wish to remain traditionally as their ancestors had been, made sure there was the teaching. Go out there and learn all that you can from these people. But never forget who you are. Never forget you have your own language, your own religion, and your own way of acceptance. In Rhode Island, some citizens who did not own property had to wait until 1928 before they were granted voting rights. But three groups were still officially barred by state law from casting a ballot. Paupers, the mentally incompetent, and Indians. The only way the Narragansetts could participate in elections was by identifying themselves as African Americans. Charles Ernest Hazard confronted officials who enforced this practice. Uh -oh. His brother, Joseph, one of the oldest members of the Narragansett nation, recalls the moment. Indians couldn't vote, so he went up to the state house and he says, uh, it's on the charter that the Indians can't vote. And he says, you vote nature? And he says, no. He says, I, I consider myself a Narragansett Indian. If I vote, I'm voting under Negroes could vote, but not an Indian. And he said, I consider myself a Narragansett, not a black, so mm. I'd like to have that changed. So they did. All right. He said he ain't a crayon color. He ain't black. You guys heard him, right? They were trying to make him classify himself and call himself an African-American or so-called black just so he can vote. All right. Looking like my grandfather. So, <laughs> all right, let's keep going. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks for your input, Nina. In 1950, after a series of delays and debates, the Narragansett were finally granted the right to vote. Despite the loss of nearly all their land, the Narragansett continued to gather together as a nation on the second Sunday of each August, a tradition with roots deep in their past. The biggest thing that we always look for, we call it the August meeting. I mean, nowadays they call it the powwow and like that, but we always call it the August meeting. The idea was to get together, socialize, exchange ideas with one another, and, you know, pass on the local gossip and things that we'd heard from out from that drifted across from the west or the midwest or any, anything was news in them days because news traveled so slow anything you heard was a big event it was a great time to see old friends because people come from all over the united states to come back uh, for august meeting if you were away you will always take your vacation and not always but you know most of the time i know i lived in california for a few years and in michigan and I always took my vacation to come home for uh, August meeting. It was a, a thing of unity and it was a thing of, uh, of acknowledging that we have survived. But the outside world could not be held at bay for long. A few weeks after these carefree gatherings, the children of the Narragansetts had to return to school. The sons and daughters of the Narragansetts faced a far different problem. After detribalization, the old Indian schoolhouse in Charlestown was officially closed and the children sent to public schools. Well, we're a minority anyway, <laughs> and I was a minor minority, is the way it seemed to me. It seemed like I'd be just the only one in uh, my class, or, or sometimes in the whole school. So, uh, I mean, things were some trying sometimes difficult you know how kids are sometimes they can be a little miserable and sometimes pick on you and call names and things like that but i mean uh as the old saying sticks and stones will hurt my bones but names never hurt me it's just one one of those things you know nothing serious native students were often confronted by history lessons that contradicted the teachings of narragansett elders like doing history class, I remember sitting there and shaking my head, you know, a teacher looking at me. I said, no, I'll it to myself. I'm telling them, letting her know. Nah, that's not right. That's not right. You know, that's not how it went because I do know my history. You know what I mean? So I don't know what she was saying was not right. Then if I corrected, of course, you know, I got sent out in the hall, you know, because I was interfering. What I would see in the, the movies, 
I was wondering if there would ever be any Indians left when I grew up, because every movie I ever saw, even in uh, silent movies and stuff like that, which I've seen, uh, seemed like a, all the Indians was dying. And the treaties were being broken and everything, and somebody would cross them up and didn't keep the word. And the first thing you know, a uh, few would be wiped out here and there. And that, that was one thing in my mind. I wonder if anything will be left when I do grow up. It just makes you tough and rugged. And you can take anything that's thrown at you. At least speaking for myself, that's the way it's worked for me. During the height of this new awareness, a champion emerged whose name would become synonymous with the Narragansett Nation. Arzen Brown's speed and determination as a track star brought international fame and recognition to the Narragansetts. But friends and family recall the lighter moments in the life of this proud young man who could run like the wind. My mother could never find him because he's always running. <laughs> and he ran by the house one day and my sister said, Mom, Allison's, his name's Allison. Allison's out there running down the road with, with his underpants on. She said, you know, we didn't know, with old fat, he didn't wear short pants and things in them days like that with his underpants on. She said, you go tell him to march, that young man, he marched right in here. And my sister chased him all the way down to the corner and told him, Mom wants you to come right back home. But he kept right on running. He was training, but we didn't know that. I used to train with that guy all the time. And we'd run down to Wesley and come around through Bradford, go about 12, 15 miles or something like that. Anyhow, he says, gee, he says, you ought to come in one of the races with me, he says, because, uh, I could come in first and you could come in second, he said. I can tell. I said to myself, what do you, you go? I'll be first. Like that. <laughs> the gun went off. Those guys took off and they went up this hill and I looked and they were going around the corner and that's the last I seen of any of them. That's the last of my running. <laughs> In January of 1975, the Narragansetts filed suit for the return of 3,200 acres of land in southern Rhode Island. They charged that the state violated the law when it sold Narragansett territory without approval from the federal government. They took everything from us through one means or another. They took everything and have been extremely reluctant to yield anything back even when Federal law clearly proved that the law had been broken, that these people had, that Rhode Island, the powers that be in Rhode Island, had violated the law. They stole the final tribally owned lands and then flourished their pens and said the tribe no longer existed. Totally illegal. Legal assistance was provided to the Narragansetts by the Native American Rights Fund. In their view, both the method and the motive of the General Assembly were all too familiar. Well, it was happening in the 1800s and then continued up right to uh, the late 1950s, where a tribe was essentially no longer recognized, uh, and the people were usually given a sum of money and their tribal lands taken uh, and then sold. The motivation is, is, is actually quite simple. They wanted Indian people, their culture, uh, their lifestyle, their religion, to disappear like they tried to make the buffalo disappear. The case was settled out of court when the state agreed to give the Narragansetts 1,800 acres of land in Charlestown. Federal legislation finalized the settlement. Well, I think we did what was right at the right time. And uh, everybody in the state of Rhode Island, I think, was sensitive to the concerns of the uh, Indians and whether or not this land was rightfully or wrongfully uh, conveyed. Uh, so I think we, with good faith, uh, tried to settle that. And I would have to say that the Indians acted in the same way. Uh, and it was uh, to Rhode Island's credit. The Rhode Island Indian Claims Settlement Act was a major victory for the Narragansetts. But it held the seeds of a future dispute. One that would grow to overshadow the hopes of those who negotiated in good faith to address the transgressions of the past. After the Settlement Act, the Narragansetts set their sights on their next goal, federal recognition. We always had recognition. What we were seeking was re-recognition and acknowledgement. The acknowledgement that would make us eligible for the uh, over 300 programs 
where Indians could receive funding for the programs that they had. And that was the, uh, the purpose of the acknowledgement. In 1983, after years of effort, the United States formally recognized the Narragansetts as a sovereign nation. Oh, it was just a nice feeling. I remember um, getting the news on the, uh, at August meeting, and some of us threw, our hat, threw up our hats and we were yelling and screaming. It was kind of nice to think all that, and they finally do realize well, we are a tribe, and we are Eastern Indians, and there are Eastern Indians. The August meetings continue to this day. Activities such as traditional dance contests attract members from other nations and a wide assortment of onlookers. Well, first of all, the August meeting is originally it was a family gathering. We were being encroached upon, and our properties were being stolen from us from residents of the state and the state. Uh, the only safe haven that was available for us to go and do our ceremonial and our spiritual type of gatherings was right in, right in that one little location, which is now referred to as an Narragansett Long uh, Meeting House or, or Indian Church. That piece of property has never been in the hands of anybody other than Narragansett people. One of the very small pieces that we managed to retain. You've got to be able to fight for who you are. You've got to, you, you, you have to respect who you are and you have to love your heritage. You have to know where your roots are and you have to live like that. No matter what anyone else does. The greatest feeling of all is to go down by the Indian church and to touch the ground and know that that ground has never, ever belonged to anyone but us. We've been here 30,000 years and I think we'll be here in another 30,000 years. Like any ethnic group celebrating its cultural history, a gathering of contemporary Native Americans presents an audience with a mixture of the old and the new. Prescription sunglasses grace the painted faces of tribal elders. Handmade bracelets and gold wristwatches adorn the same arm. Regalia, the buckskins, beads, and feathered headdresses worn at such special occasions, are often based on historic garments of Western nations. Appropriating a style of dress that is easily recognized as Native American has become a common practice in recent times. Now everyone knows that it would have been senseless for in the uh, forested areas for the people to run around with great feathered bonnets. However, they are beautiful. And for celebration and for decoration, it's fine to have evolved to the point where you would want to wear it. So it's just an evolution and, and uh, an adoption of things of beauty. Gatherings like the August meeting are often the first time that the public has the opportunity to meet the Narragansetts. The sensitive issue of race can arise when outsiders arrive with preconceived notions of what an American Indian should look like. A person is who they identify themselves as. It is not what's in their bloodstream, it's what's in their heart and how they feel. Uh, if people want to get into ethnicity uh, or racism, that's their problem. I think the tribe has a right to identify who their members are, as with all nations. And we as in the United States is the greatest example of that. So my people are my people, regardless as to who they are. The years following federal recognition of the Narragansetts were times of transition and tribulation. Federal funds were a tremendous boost to a group of people whose average incomes were well below the poverty level. But these new resources and the administrative responsibilities associated with them caused problems for the Narragansetts. Oh sure, there were growing pains. Um, I, can't, I can't be used to having a nickel and making it go in a thousand directions, and suddenly somebody gives me $20. That's, that's a growing process. Um, I can't be expected to know what to do with that $20 because I hardly knew what to do with that nickel. So how do you suddenly, just overnight, just expect me to know what to do, what to do with that $20? It doesn't work that way. The results of a tribal election were contested. Friction increased between members who identified with traditional customs and those who had become more assimilated into the non-native mainstream. It wasn't 
uh, good times for the Narragansetts. We, we really didn't choose to go the, the way things went at the time. It was something that was just placed upon us. Uh, we had to make some very fast decisions on our feet. Some of us were literally put our lives on the line in defense, defense of our people and our rights. An argument over which faction had the right to use a tribal vehicle led to an ugly confrontation with the police outside a Narragansett meeting house. I have no problem defending who I am and what I am and defending the rights of my people. Uh, if I have to be arrested in defense of my people, I'll go to jail every day of the week. Um, we're not about to lay down and roll over, and we're not about to allow an outsider to come in and dictate who we are, what we are, and how we're going to maintain our internal controls. Media attention that focused on divisions within the nation was deeply resented by many of the Narragansetts. You know, they say Columbus discovered America. He came over here and landed on the graves of my people. So he was not the first American. So it's like, you know, they're always talking about how we argue among themselves. Do they ever tell us how they argue among themselves? And I know they do because I've been out there. And I know. Today, the Narragansett seem to have come to terms with many of the problems that divided them in the past. As families disagree with issues, uh, so does a tribe. Uh, but there isn't that division now, and that's just a sign of you know, a tribe coming together as, as um, you would hope a tribe would be, and a community being a community. And we're moving forward together again as best as possible. Tangible evidence of cooperative effort, such as the construction and dedication of a federally funded Indian health center, is celebrated by all. It's a great day. <laughs> but the struggle for acceptance and respect is by no means over. Members of the Narragansett Nation can still be the targets of racial slurs and bigotry. It's very upsetting to read in the media the negativity about our people, uh, the racism which is rampant in this state against the Narragansett. It, it breaks my heart because I love every piece of this ground. I've lived all over the United States. I keep coming back to Rhode Island because this is home. This is, this is the land my parents taught me to love. Membership in the Narragansett Nation is determined in large part by the tribal role of the 1880s. Right now, we're going by the 1880 to 1884 roads. So you have a grandparent on the roads. Well, you know, you got to prove that that is your grandparent. You know, or we, well, we have a grandparent or great great of course. You know, they have to prove, you know, to us that that is their grandparent. So apparently, it comes right down to lying to their mother and right unto them, you know. So they have to prove this, you know. Deciding who may claim membership and who may not has become a thorny issue for many nations, including the Narragansetts. We have a lot of them that can't prove it and has been on the rules, you know? So we, that's a kind of a sticky issue at this point, you know? But, uh, well, we haven't had no too much back, backlash on it just yet, but I suppose it's coming, you know? In the 18th century, some of the Narragansett converted to Christianity. A granite church was built in the heart of the Charlestown Reservation. It stood for more than a century until 1993, when it became the victim of a suspicious fire. The church was rebuilt and rededicated three years later. Hundreds of natives and non-natives attended a service led by the Narragansett's dynamic minister, the Reverend Oren Mars. On behalf of the Narragansett Indian Church, we'd like to welcome you here. Uh, the woods welcome you. The animals welcome you. And so do we. God knows all of his people. He made us all. And had it only been done right the first time, we'd all been friends from the beginning. And we've been in these woods for many years. Extend the hand of fellowship to us. Visit us. You will get to know us. And if allowed, you're going to have more love on your hand than you can handle. You give me time, I'll show you how to find it. We want to thank you and God bless you. A shared sense of faith and goodwill with the outside world is important to many of the Narragansetts. 
but hidden deep in the collective memory of the Narragansett people. There are scars that will never heal. Each year, the Narragansett solemnly draw together in the shadow of a granite monument and pay homage to the victims of the Great Swamp Massacre. It's almost like you can hear the old people crying and wailing. It's a very sad thing, that, a hurtful thing. They waited until the water froze over so that they could go in when they were hiding, and these were all elderly people and children, and, uh, and they just went in, and, and to me, they murdered them. And, and that's, you know, it, it, it makes a, a real sad, hard, hard feeling in my heart that uh, anybody could do this. Our people have always had to deal with the madness of those people who came across in that European invasion. Everywhere they entered, they had to conquer and to take over. Some members of the Narragansett nation feel strongly that attacks on the Narragansetts did not end in the 17th century. They believe that new battles are being fought today in courtrooms, in corporate offices, and even in the halls of Congress. It's very important that we as the people do not forget who and what we are. For the white men to listen, or anyone else, I will say this. As the battle rages around us, so does, does the battle rage within. Look at your first fire. See the signs. The strength and dealing with that battle must come from within. In 1979, members of the Seminole Nation opened a commercial bingo establishment on their reservation. Encouraged by its success, other nations across the country began their own gambling ventures. Conflicts soon erupted among state, federal, and tribal governments regarding the jurisdiction over these facilities. It became obvious uh, from the very moment that if nothing was done, it would be absolute chaos. Because the natural consequence would be tribes looking at this as a God-given opportunity and without any rules, supervision, regulations, start putting it up. And obviously, you will have uh, violence on both sides. To solve this problem, Congress passed the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act known as IGRA. The initial step that the committee took, or the Congress took, was to look upon the relationship of Indians and the government, and it's a government-to-government -government relationship, federal and tribes. It's not state and tribes. The Indian Claims Act of 1978 stated that settlement land would be subject to the laws of Rhode Island, and state law prohibited the establishment of a gaming facility without voter approval. Senators Claiborne Pell and John Chafee attempted to add an amendment to IGRA that would prevent it from overriding the Rhode Island Settlement Act. Senator Pell uh, wanted to insert a, an amendment that said, we want to make it very clear this does not abrogate the agreement that has been in and into in Rhode Island and has been codified in federal law. But Senator Daniel Inouye, chairman of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, was opposed to adding such an amendment. Obviously, if we accepted that and put that into bill language, then we knew the consequences would be no bill. There's no doubt before. No doubt. The amendment was withdrawn before passage of the bill, but Senator Inouye allowed a formal discussion of its content, known as colloquy, in the committee's final report. When the Narragansetts announced their intention to open a gambling facility, Rhode Island filed a lawsuit to stop them. The state offered the Senate colloquy as evidence that the Settlement Act, not the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, should apply to the Narragansetts. But a federal court ruled in favor of the Narragansetts and issued a strongly worded decision. Once Congress has spoken, it is bound by what it has plainly said notwithstanding the nods and winks that may have been exchanged in floor debates and committee hearings. 
In, in other words, uh, contrary to what Senator Inouye indicated, uh, the Gaming Act did change very key provisions of the uh, of the Rhode Island Land Claims Settlement Act. After the court decision, Senators Pell and Chafee made one last attempt to amend the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. But by then, the chairman of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee had experienced a change of heart. I did have some regrets because by having that colloquy, it did add confusion to confusion. Since uh, the colloquy, I had the opportunity to look into it. and I, I realized that, as I said publicly, that I think my position was wrong. Following the federal court's decision, Rhode Island Governor Bruce Sundland entered into negotiations with the Narragansetts. A referendum that would allow the Narragansetts to build a casino on non-tribal land was placed on the ballot. Several other gambling ventures backed by private investors were also proposed. All were rejected by the voters. The citizens of the state of Rhode Island have spoken clearly on this subject. And I think their views are of some consequence. Under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, states must allow native nations to offer the same form of gambling on their land that is legal within that state. And Rhode Island is no stranger to gambling. Gross annual sales by its Lottery Commission have totaled nearly a half billion dollars in recent years. The Narragansetts proposed building a gaming facility on their property. But Rhode Island's new governor, Lincoln Almond, refused to negotiate with them, citing his opposition to gambling. The tribe feels the governor's position is hypocritical because the state relies on revenues from lotteries, video poker, dog racing, kino, and other games of chance. We just visited the governor with a, a, a zero tolerance pledge and asked him, challenged him to um, take a zero tolerance stance on, on gaming dollars uh, coming into the state coffers and the state budget. And to date, the governor hasn't given us an official response, but it stands a reason he won't sign it because he's reliant too much on those gaming dollars. That's a fine example of what the tribe was intending to do with its gaming dollars um, within establishing on the reservation. As much as he's relying upon those dollars to uh, take care of whatever budget issues or um, needs that come up in the state, that's what we were gonna do with our people. Governor Armin continues to oppose gambling on Narragansett lands. He declined to be interviewed for this program. The Supreme Court chose not to review Rhode Island's appeal against the Narragansetts, thereby allowing the federal court ruling to stand. The Narragansetts had won their case. Unable to amend the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, Senator Chafee employed a new course of action. Chafee's target was the Settlement Act, a compact negotiated between the Narragansetts and the state of Rhode Island almost 20 years earlier. That's my understanding that one party of that contract cannot unilaterally, unilaterally change the language, particularly if the other party didn't default. I'm upset. I've said what I wanted to say. Well, no, because I, I just think what we did was, was not only fair and accurate, it was, a, it was the... It, it reinforced what everybody had originally agreed to. Chafee attached an amendment to a major federal spending bill which read, For purposes of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, settlement lands shall not be treated as Indian lands. We're con engaging in a double standard here with our Narragansett tribe, and they're the only tribe in this country in, in this uh, um, conference report that's singled out like this. We had no hearings on this issue in the uh, Natural Resources Committee, um, I think it's a, a really discriminatory measure for us to say it's all right for us to game, provide for our people, but at the same time saying, no, uh, Native Americans, we're not going to allow you to do what we're, we're uh, doing ourselves. The spending bill passed, and with it, Chafee's amendment. The Narragansetts were outraged. So I say I think we should all saddle up and ride over to Chafee's office right now and let him know how we feel. Huh? You know, you have a right and suddenly it's taken away because I don't like you having that right. That's basically how it was done. Um, 
I don't agree with you having that right. I have the ability to change the law. I'll change the law. Is this fair? Opposition to the Narragansett's plans are not limited to politicians. Local groups say they fear the impact that a gaming facility might have on their community. Well, I'm concerned about conservation in South County. After the state <laughs> enacted the uh, Zoning Enabling Act in 1991, it allows communities to um, take a much stronger role in protecting natural resources. And that would all have no meaning if at the center of town you have a huge commercial operation. The idea that Charlestown residents are concerned about overdevelopment seems ironic to some of the Narragansetts. If people are concerned, people fly by night, people that blow in and out on the wind, if they're concerned about Charleston, then just imagine how the tribe, some whose families never left this area, imagine how they felt with the intrusion of all the non-Indians that have come into the Charleston area. And we give you this with our great love. There are those who count themselves as friends of the Narragansetts who have spoken out against the idea of gambling on tribal land. Uh, we feel that the voice of the church has needed to be raised on that. And we're saying to the Native Americans, my God, why do you want that? Why do you want that? Because it is going to affect the very values that have been the most enriching from your culture, and your religious faith to us. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna kill you. Despite such pleas, the Narragansetts say they will continue to challenge legal obstacles, which they argue have little to do with gambling and everything to do with tribal sovereignty. Okay, land settlement was a vehicle for, for conflict. Recognition was a vehicle for conflict. Housing was a vehicle for conflict. Any kind of development, building or anything, a vehicle for conflict, right? So this recent thing on gaming, merely a vehicle for conflict to, to challenge a sovereignty and to impose jurisdiction upon the Narragansetts. Over 500 native nations have been recognized as sovereign nations by the federal government. That special status is difficult for many non-native citizens to accept, but experts point out that this unique relationship was forged early in the history of the Republic. It's in the Constitution. It's part of the many decisions of the Supreme Court. It's been legislated upon time and again. Sovereignty is very clear. Now, they've paid a heavy price for this. We seem to forget that they were here long before we got here, and uh, that's their land. Some of the Narragansetts feel that racism is the hidden force that motivates those who oppose their plans. When you have uh, people that are predominantly of one race, and you have an Indian tribe, and every action of the powers that be in a state are trying to thwart whatever the tribe tries to do, regardless how legal the tribe's actions are, then that's racist. Give me the logic behind widespread gambling that exists in the state, but yet the tribe can't do it because they are an Indian tribe. But opponents of gambling like Senator Chafee, whose record on civil rights is unblemished, dismiss such accusations. People can make all kinds of ridiculous charges, but Thank goodness the, the people of the state of Rhode Island are pretty thoughtful and pretty, uh, they don't go for that. Chafee's amendment remains law. What tomorrow will bring for the Narragansett nation remains to be seen. Despite the current controversy, leaders emphasize that gaming and the wealth it might provide are not the most important factors in their future. Whether this tribe moves forth with gaming or not is irrelevant. But what we must protect is what is rightfully ours through congressional laws or through our own inherent laws. We realize that we all need money to exist in this world today. And all we're doing is looking to provide a better lifestyle in the areas of health, education, and welfare for our people. If this gaming thing is something that can do that, fine. If there's other opportunities that we can provide a lifestyle that is, is compatible to, to mainstream for our people, then too, that's good too. But when you look at all the statistics dealing you know, with Indian people, we sit at the bottom of that totem pole in every respect.
Ultimately, what the Narragansetts are seeking from the rest of society may be more fundamental in nature. I would say to look at us as human beings, not much different than anyone else. Maybe a little different in color, but we have some that are educated, we have some that are not educated, we have some that are perfectly wonderful gentlemen and ladies, we have some that are not, but we are just exactly like any other group of people. I think that's what they should should look at and that and that we have been here forever. Not came from here, there, or every anywhere. We were here. I think that that should be brought into their mind that they most everybody came here and we were here. And uh I think those that deserve respect should get it. In recent years, the Narragansetts have added their voice to a chorus of other native nations, seeking a new relationship, trust, and mutual respect between their people and the United States. All right, all right. So we are done with one part of the presentation today. I said to you guys, I had a bonus. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that one. I wanted to bring that out of the archives. <laughs> hey, it was getting dusty again. Um, yeah, 30,000 years. Imagine. I say, that's what she said, you know, oral tradition, right? Hey, Air Shad, is that, was that you dancing, the little boy right there? <laughs> yeah, they're all grown men now. Yeah, that's right, man. Uh, that's an old documentary. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, fair use. It was for uh, education and commentary and for building and for remembering you know, his, uh, that's his story. Yeah, of course, you know, uh, we're going to get into, uh, one of my, uh, let me see, we've got a little bit more research here. We're going to get a little bonus here. Hope you guys enjoy it. Let me see. intermission here We're about to get into another uh, documentary here by Cootie Mayo <laughs> yeah hope you guys enjoyed thanks for uh, tuning in don't go anywhere mantra a little mantra meditation to get in to get the vibes right we're gonna go into some deep history here so i found this article from the duke university press uh this is from uh ethno history volume 44 number three from 1997 between pages 433 and 462 by ruth wallace hernan and ella wilcox sekatau and uh, this is where you can find this. Again, Duke University Press, fair use. It says the right to a name, the Narragansett people and Rhode Island officials in the Revolutionary 
uh, error. And it says here, abstract. Now pay attention to this. It says, drawn on oral tribal history and written town records, we argued that an oppositional relationship existed between native people and Rhode Island town leaders, all right? In the latter half of the 18th century, authorities viewed native people most often as the poor of the town, all right? The natives were the poor of the town whose lives required official management, official management, public housing, section eight, who stands? What, what, what do you mean? Required official management. Further, these officials redesignated Native people as Negro or Black in the written record, preparing the way for tribal extinction. All right. Again, where are we? We've got two people here from the University of Toledo, and the other one is a Narragansett person herself. All right. This is a Ethnology Volume 444 again. What was going on? They were redesignating native people or aboriginals as Negro or Black. All right, we've seen that in the census. We, we know uh, <laughs> what Walter Plecker did. We know even before Walter Plecker what they were doing. All right, you see what they doing to these people. All right. This is real history right here. These ain't Africans, but I bet you you're calling them African-American today. These same people, if you saw them in the street. Yep. All right. But the officials, these officials, right? These people reclassified these people as Negro or black in the written record. They were preparing the way for tribal extinct extinction. They were trying to raise you confederate against you erase your name from being a nation uh oh erase your name from being a nation psalms uh -oh. 83 uh oh native people in contrast often maintained a sense of their identity understood the local government sometimes conflicted with their own best interest and maneuvered around the system to to their own advantage all right Continuing says in 1675, in the heat of a regional war with natives people, New England colonists killed hundreds of the Narragansett. All right, who's the Narragansett? Same people they're classifying as Negro or black. They're killing Negro people, black people, so-called black, so-called Negro. But in this region, they were killing Narragansett. Aboriginals, <laughs> all right, hundreds of them, thousands uninvolved in the war at that point in an unprovoked attack on on one of their winter camps located in great swamp in south kingston rhode island kingstown 200 years later in 1880 the rhode island state legislature without federal approval declared the narragansett people extinct you see what they said they said you went extinct your people up there in rhode island See, paper genocide, right? Mm -hmm. Got so many forms of this all over the states in North America and everywhere else in the Americas in different ways. All right, so they started saying, oh, the last Indian died, right? We got that in the last video, right? Oh, the last Indian died. You're still here. You ain't extinct. They can't extinct you. <laughs> You're from creation. Uh-oh. All right? But we're talking about an, a, a real Holocaust, right? Hmm. All right. Uh oh. And illegally, what they do, they took away the tribal status of people who still call themselves by that name. All right. All right so, yeah, man, we're going back in time. Cootie Mail, back in time, getting deep. Huh? <laughs> wow. Okay, man, let's make sure we stay on live. Hey, Cootie Mail, we got to tone it down, man. Don't mention the Chasers. All right, number one. Where's the source? We go look for it. She's got the sources. All right. They were doing this. <laughs> In the centuries between these notorious events, generations of the Narragansett faced the choice of staying on their native land, surrounded by non-Indians, or migrating to Western land, 
less settled by Europeans. Many of these native people, deeply alienated by the religious beliefs and cultural practices of the Europeans left mainly for Massachusetts, New York, and Wisconsin. Others stayed on ancestral lands. Oral history tells us that they continued their tribal affairs and government, held frequent meetings, kept track of their heritage and lineage, and kept alive the religion, language, and customs of the people. All right. Now, the people, again, that was being redesignated as Negro or Black. I'm talking about Aboriginals. Uh -oh. All right. All right. Preserve in Narragansett culture on Narragansett land was an arduous task initially. Within the first decades of English colonization, Narragansett leaders realized what were the goals of these newly arrived people. The colonists' attitudes toward land crashed radically with the practices of native people. Traditional ways of gardening and hunting proved impossible for the Narragansett after the English settlers had altered the ecosystem. They came and messed up your land so you couldn't grow no more by dividing the land into private tracts for individual use or lots, by prosecuting trespassers by cutting down forests, constructing fences, and otherwise helping to extinguish game, and by introducing free-ranging livestock. You see, they came like a plague. The Rhode Island government's protective act to set apart 64 square miles of land as a Narragansett reservation in 1709 signaled that native people could no longer move freely over their ancestral territory. All right, so they gave you them a little piece, but they had a large piece, and then they said you couldn't go to the other pieces you used to roam at. Now you got to stay in that little piece. All right, they couldn't move freely over their ancestral territory and observe the cultural practice of having summer and permanent residences in different places. All right, permanent summer. All right, during the 18th century, moreover, the reserved area shrank as non Narragansett people acquired tracts through sale, death, and gifts. The Narragansett living on the reservation could not always avoid contact with Rhode Island's colonists. Some were pulled into the European American world by the economy economic necessity of working as day laborers in nearby towns. Others left the reservation and drifted away, physically and spiritually, from the paths of the elders. I right? drifted away. Physically, and what else? Spiritually. All right, so you might be here hmm. physically, but are you here spiritually? Uh-oh, good question. Frequency war. This is a frequency war. Oh, yeah. It's not just about the physical. Nope. Where's your spirit at? Where's your spirit? Yep. All right. You drifted away spiritually from the paths of the elders. Oh, yeah. And some converted to what? Christianity. Christ we all converted to Christianity. They made us. Jesus. They came with their Christianity. Jesus. He is Zeus. The dog. Uh-oh. <laughs> Toph. We're talking about the trickster. The Zeus. The bird Jupiter. is the word. Belus. <laughs> All right. Some married non-Indians and merged into the cultures of European and African Americans. Dodge the hijack. What you mean? Some prisoners at the end of the 1675-76 conflict or trapped in debt to Rhode Islanders became bound servants. Became what? Indentured. Bound servants. Yep. Not slaves. Uh uh. 1600s. Yep. They became what? Bound servants, and who are they again? People yeah. that they were reclassifying, redesignated as Negro or Black. Uh huh. They're talking about Aboriginals. Uh huh. And then, right. yep. Real history. Who became bound servants, indentured servants. All right. Slavery is not what you thought. It's not. Two and thus members of the English households. All right. Oral tradition tells us that many native family and clan names disappeared as local officials attached English names to Narragansett people uh -oh. who were indebted or bound to colonists. Wow. All right. They lost they lost track of your ancestry, they say, right? They did that on purpose. <laughs> Once you were indebted or bound to colonists, they gave you English names. Wow. They gave you English names. 
they baptized you English names. They did that all over the Americas. They gave us Spanish names. Hmm. All right. French. You're an indentured servant. Portuguese. Overstand. Contract. Balance. Dutch. There was a contract, a service you were providing. So things seemed to, so things seemed to outsiders. But tribal history passed down orally from generation to generation informs us that hardship and oppression strengthened the res the resolve of many Narragansett to maintain traditional ways. The majority of the Narragansett on or around the reservation did not convert to Christianity. All right, and those who did usually moved away from Rhode Island. Many native people whom outsiders count, counted as converts were actually struggling to coexist with the English. These Narragansett presented themselves in ways that won the approval of outside observers and authorities, but in their own confines they continued to practice the cultural ways of the ancients. Not until the illegal detribalization of 1880 did true conversions begin in some Narragansett families. All right, so this is a very, very good article. Again, it's called The Right to a Name, the Narragansett People and Rhode Island Officials in the Revolutionary Era. All right, very scholarly article from the Ethnology. All right, eth Ethnohistory, I'm sorry. Ethnohistory, Volume 44. Mm -hmm. All right, let's just go back to the source right here. There you go. As so you can see, Ethnohistory, Volume 44, Number 3, from 1997, pages 433 to 468, all right? Do the research and um, just want to show you. I'm not going to read, but I just want to show you something real quick. Um, so get a reference of what you know it goes into. Look at this chart right here. Now it says Table One Public Indentures of Children in Rhode Island, 1750 to 1800. All right, so again, what public indentures? Uh -huh. Indentures. It says Job Smith contracted to teach Peter Norton, a poor, musty boy, a poor, musty 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 so musty boy the copper's trade the copper's trade but he also promised that norton would learn to read all right so he got indentured so he can trade in copper right there was a specific service they were getting him for but then they also said he might be able to learn how to read and write print and keep a common book accounts so they were gonna also invest in him to learn to read and write so he can be like an accountant for them So town leaders expected indentured servitude to prepare poor children for independent adulthood apprenticeship. You understand? These weren't slave kids for, you know, Chattel. All right. They were preparing them to be servicemen as well as in their adulthood in the, or independent adulthood. Mm -hmm. so these were indentured servants. Terminology. Poor children. They were preparing. All right. Giving them trades, contracts, they were uh -huh. running service. Yep. Whether or not masters always fulfilled their obligations to the children is another question. Uh oh. And that's what we've been trying to break down. I hope you saw my recap yesterday. They, you know, <laughs> their contracts were not being met. They're indentured. So, like, again, they're telling you right here, Ethno History, Volume 44, whether or not masters always fulfilled their obligations to the children is another question. All right. They weren't letting you go, they weren't meeting their contract. Mm -hmm. Their indenture. Yep. Oral history tells us that many native people emerge from indenture without literacy skills. All right. They weren't even preparing them. All right. So indenture, indenture. Now look, where's the black in this? Right? <laughs> so what are we saying? All all who? Native, all, and then you see whites here. So what do you uh, you know? Uh, yeah. Make it make sense. <laughs> Uh -oh. oh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, oh, man, got me dancing and everything. Hi, um, school we call cinemas in Tampuag. My name is Dawn Dove. This place that we're at, down here at the spring on our reservation, is a very special place, and it's a place that I've come to all of my life. It's a place that my grandmothers brought me, and the sacredness of our lands, the tradition, and the history of our people have been shared. 
We belong here. This place belongs to us, and we belong to this place. Mm. Yes, yes. My name is Thorn Harris. I'm 34 years old. I'm a member of the Narragansett tribe. I feel really blessed and honored to, to be in the position that I'm in today, uh, to be a member of our tribe. There's approximately 3,000 Narragansetts in our tribe, and when you think about that, we're an endangered species. There's only 3,000 of us left in the world. If you look back at the history of our people, we have always been a strong people. We were the most dominant tribe in this Northeast New England area. Uh, we made it all the way up into the main area to New York. It's been passed down to me that uh, the Iroquois people, one of the reasons that they actually formed a confederacy is because of the strength of the Narragansett people. We reached out into Long Island and, and all over this area. It was written about us uh, since contact with the Vikings. Many people think of these Vikings, you know, these, these strong warrior people. They came here, they were not able to overtake the Narragansett people. They, they came into our bay and uh, they, they were welcomed as we were a welcoming people, but they could see the strength and the beauty of our people. People think of 1634 as a, a beginning, a beginning date. And that is a beginning of lands being taken. Lands that we were willing to share, that you could use, but we didn't have a concept of, well, now you can no longer hunt or fish or walk on those lands. And then, 1675 is another date that comes into mind. The massacre of the Narragansett people at Great Swamp. That massacre that we pilgrimage to each year to remember our people of the past, those that died and those that lived, those that continued on the sadness that touches my heart when I see our lands, they have been usurped and taken from us. It's very painful. Ascoliquazin. It's hello in my native tongue. My name's Randy Noka. I'm a tribal councilman for the Narragansett tribe. My native name is Paponi Maquasham, which means winter wolf in English. And I've been on tribal council for, oh, about 16 years now. Um, by chance, I'm standing in front of the smoke shop um, for the tribe. And yeah, this is an important um, property for the Narragansett. And this is where the raid happened. Um, the state police from Rhode Island raided uh, our smoke shop. It had been opened up for a couple days, but to think that tw uh, 51 state troopers uh, raided under order of the then Governor Kachiri came and raided the smoke shop where we were selling cigarettes because as they were um, 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 alleging, we were selling smoke uh, cigarettes illegally because it didn't have Rhode Island tax stamp. But to think that Rhode Island had to send in state troopers over an alleged illegal sale of cigarettes. People should realize what, what has happened to us. This is our land, and it was taken from us illegally down through the years. But yet we're still here, and we're still trying to be good neighbors, despite what's happened to us. We are uh, right behind the tribal basketball court, and I feel this is a great representative area for myself as I've always loved basketball, and I'm kind of at that middle age to kind of connect the youth. And you, when you think of youth, we have a playground over here, volleyball and that, uh, this basketball uh, court uh, with some of the elders, you know, who have done this in the past. Uh, and this community center is a great place as we have a daycare here. Uh, we have a tribal elders senior center here. We have a meal site. Uh, and we have the place where all our people come to have meetings. We're here. We're always going to be here. We're a proud people. 
But we're not looking for handouts. We're not looking for uh, sympathy again. We're looking for a respect and an understanding that, to date, not many have had. When we think about today, where we are today, I do think it's incredible that we have survived and that we continue to be Narragansett people. I guess to uh, continue a little bit with uh, Chief Sisko and his family in the tribe Hassanamisco, Massachusetts. I, I found this article way back. Uh, it's called Contested Places, the History and Meaning of Hassanamisco by Donna Ray Gould, PhD, University of Connecticut, 2010. And it just says a little bit here. This study focuses on the cultural landscape in southern New England the Hassanamisco Reservation in Cisco Homestead in Grafton, Massachusetts. I demonstrate how this place is a significant location to be studied and recognized as a cultural landscape important to the region's history. Very important to the region's history, all right? And it says that this is, again, uh, the University of Connecticut. It's a, a dissertation submitted in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut, all right? So she put in her work and research behind this. All right, so I went down to uh, where it says chapter one, introduction, and it has this image right here. All right, we already got Chief Sisko right here, all the way to the left. I believe his daughter, we've seen her in a lot of different pictures as well. All right, and I think he's also uh, her, his, his son. Let me just see, it tells us right here. So it says, figure one, two generations of the Sisko family post around 1930. At a gathering, from left, James Lemuel, Cisco in an Indian headdress and suit, his daughter, daughter Sarah Cisco, in more traditional regalia, and her brother, Horace Cisco, in completely modern dress, right? His son as well. All right, they're all Hassan Misco Indians, Nipmuc Indians from Massachusetts, Aboriginals. Do you see that? Today, these people will be called African American or so-called black, or they'll say, well, they have to be mixed with Africans and slaves or something, because look at them. They're not understanding. No, these are aboriginals of America. That's what they look like. All right? Not everybody came out of Africa. Within this one family, public expressions of their Indian identity varied. All right? But the Cisco family consistently present, represented the goal of cultural preservation and was responsible for the preservation of the Cisco homestead and the Hassan Amisco reservation without which this study would not have been possible. All right. All right, and uh, down here, it shows where Grafton is uh, located in Massachusetts. Boston is around here, right on the coast. All right, and Grafton is right here when the circle is. Grafton, the eastern half of Massachusetts, indicating the location of present-day Grafton in Worcester County, all right, near Worcester City or town, all right? All right, further down in the uh, this article, page like 120, it says the Hassan Amisco Reservation. Walking towards like a uh, flyer or a poster, it says the Hassan Amisco Reservation is the country's smallest American Indian reservation, encompassing 3.5 acres in Grafton, Massachusetts. It is the remnant of the original Hassan Amisco praying plantation, praying Indians, right? Litma. Established by the Reverend John Elliot. All right, John Elliot. Remember John Elliot in 1649 to convert the local Indians. These are the descendants of those same people. John Elliot had these were so called Negroes. Just you just saw Mr. Cisco, right? So this is in basically what was left over. All right, from the original Hassan Amisit praying plantation. John Elliot, who wrote the first Bible in the Americas, it was written in Algonquin. In the Algonquin language. It wasn't written in English, Spanish, or any other language. The first Bible made here was in Algonquin because they were trying to get you, they were trying to convert your ancestors into Christianity. All right? And a lot of the stories they knew. So they were like, oh man, it makes sense. And they helped, you know, John Elliot would preach to them and all that. And it says the walking tour tells the story of this land and its people. All right? Too bad we can't zoom into this. So it says at home with the Cisco's, right? The, and the Cisco's, right? The ones who uh, founded this and were able to maintain this land and, 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 and establish a reservation, right? This is what this article talks about. All right. All right. So I want to show you this other image right here. This is actually uh, from the 1930 Worcester Telegram newspaper. 
uh, says an article provides one example of recognition by outsiders of the historical significance of the last piece of Indian land in Grafton and the Cisco homestead. All right. So it says here, last of Indian tribe clings to tro- tribal home. All right. Let me see if I can zoom in. All right. You see that? James Cisco. What is that? Who is that? That's Chief Cisco. All right. so-called Negro, right? He clings on to the last remaining land in Grafton. Appreciate everybody tuned in, going back in time here, uh, you know, going over some recordings. Hope you guys enjoying it. Thanks for uh, tuning in. All right. So here that the homestead and reservation represent a cultural landscape that has survived over the centuries despite the Euro- Euro-American settlements all around it, creating a place distinct and different from its surroundings. All right. So that's they were trying to hold on to this piece of land for so many years. All right. So to make sure you know the story of how San Francisco, his daughter, fought and all that and all these people to preserve this reservation. Got another article here. It says another Worcester newspaper article from 1948 also demonstrates that outsiders, much like the Ciscos, understood that the Hasana Misco reservation was significant because it represented the final piece of land never owned by the white man. A final piece of land never owned by the white man was owned and still is owned by so-called aboriginals right now. All right, can you say that about any other part in, in the States? Well, in this region, this is one of those parts that was never owned. All right, these were never Africans. These were aboriginals who owned this land. All right, Nipmuc Indians that were there since ancient times. And it says here, last Indian in Grafton lives on land never owned by white man never owned by a white man all right never owned by a white man european so-called white further down here says despite the many meanings and uses that the homestead and reservation have had over the centuries we're talking about the name hasana misco because of its endurance this place is one of the most important physical elements of nitmuk history and culture to survive today it is where newly born tribal members receive their name each year where forgiveness prevails at the annual strawberry moon gathering each june where the thanksgiving holiday in quotes is remembered with sol- solemnity and three days of gathering by indians from all over massachusetts and where nitmuk people continue to teach outsiders about their heritage above all this place is a type of living memory a nidma culture serving as a, a mnemonic device to the many that use interpret debate and deny it as a symbol of nidma presence on the landscape all right all right so now in this part of the article they're talking about this uh how they were like messing up history by, by putting false information about the indians and who they were and what they were mixed with and all this other stuff this is one of them says report to the governor and council concerning the indians of the commonwealth under the act of april 6 1859 by john milton earl so it's called the earl report it says in addition to defining what indians should look and act like earl also identified foreigners all right, whom he defined as one not an Indian. All right, but also knows that he that the Indian sense of this term is one not native of the plantation. All right, so they're not talking about people who are not Indians. They just mean not Indians from that specific specific place, or not of this plantation, or of one of the kindred tribes. Uh, foreigners, according to Earl, were either non-Indians living in Indian households, or Indians not local to the tribe they were residing with, or Indians. They were also Indians, so any foreigner they were naming in these documents, they just meant an Indian not local to the tribe they were residing with. They were from another tribe. How Earl defined one of the kindred tribes remained unclear, but his definition of a non-local Indian as foreign demonstrated that he had little or no knowledge of the extensive intertribal kinship system that have existed throughout southern New England for at least centuries. Much like the, his racial stereotyping, Earl's definition of Indians according to Euro-American state boundaries further indicates that his understanding of Indian identity and relations was limited. All right, now check this out. It says, for example, in the Cisco household, all right, of 1860, such as a foreigner recited, all right, so they listed a foreigner living in the Cisco household. His name was Samuel Cisco. Earl defined him as a colored foreigner. He's a colored. What does that mean? We already know he's a Negro, right? Colored, colored foreigner. 
Now we know already heard that foreigner could mean it's just an Indian that's just from another tribe. All right. And Cisco, we know the Cisco. All right, we're gonna read this right now. It says and farmer living with the, his Hassan Amisco wife Sarah Maria Cisco. All right. So he was living there. He's a colored guy, 40 years old at the time. And there are five children, including 13-year-old James Lemuel Cisco. All right. Sarah was the owner of their property, half acres with a small house, believed to be all the real estate in Massachusetts belonging to the tribe. Despite Earl's classification of Samuel Cisco as a foreigner, and they're leaving out the colored part, marriages, especially among Indians, were often the result of long-standing connections, especially among Indians. They were all Indians. This colored guy they were naming, he was an Indian. All right? Between families and tribes that continued throughout the 19th century and up through the present, in the Cisco homestead, Samuel Cisco provided a connection to the Narragansett ancestry acknowledged generations later by his great-granddaughter, Sarah Cisco Bro. All right, he was a Narragansett. She was Hassan Amisko Nidmak, and he was a Narragansett. Two Indian families. All right, and they remember they call him a colored foreigner. All right, he's a Narragansett. We already could know that they were so-called Negro, right? They were being classified as well as black and Negro. All right. Errol's classification of Indians such as Samuel Cisco as foreigners, just as with his miscellaneous classification, has created historical documentation of Indian populations by non-native that also define boundaries native people did not necessarily have or recognize. All right, so that created some issues that were letting you know. All right, we got another uh, image here. I just wanted to show you. It says, last of her tribe. Ms. Althea Hazard of the Hassan Amisco Indians. She succumbs to long illness at Oxford believe that she was aged 105 she, she lived to 105 and uh, just real quick here it says what is thought to be the last of the Hassan Amisco or Nidmak tribe of Indians passed away today in the person of Miss Althea Hazard who died shortly after midnight this morning all right that's the thing so it says this is from 1903 obituary notice so they keep saying last right which clearly announces her as the last tribe they keep trying to race you. They keep trying to say it's the last one. That's what the lady was saying in the other video. How every year they kept saying it's the last Indian. The last Indian died. The last Indian died. All right. Now it says here, the fact that Althea Hazard was closely connected to Mary Curtis Vickers and her family was an important piece of evidence in Ned Magnation's federal acknowledgement case. The connection between these families provides further evidence that the Vickers family maintained ties with other Ned Mac families, which is an important criteria for the federal acknowledgement review process. All right, this is a bit of uh, side history there. Now I want to go down to this uh, image right here. All right, now who's that? We got that in the other book, right? It says last the Hassan Amisco tribe of Indians, dead. Another one, the last one, right? This is Chief Cisco, congrats to Chief James L. Cisco. All right, it says the 1931 obituary notice of James Lemuel Cisco provides another example of how public documents perpetuated a discourse of disappearance about Nidmak Indians in the 20th century, paper genocide. They were trying to erase you saying, yo, the last one died. This is a so-called Negro. You mean the last full blood Indian was a Negro? So what do you mean? So, but I thought Negroes came from Africa. I thought people of color came from Africa. This is a full blood Hassan Amisko Nidmak Indian. says as the discussion above demonstrate throughout the 19th century and into the 20th the myth of vanishing indians in massachusetts permeated popular and historical accounts they kept doing that with this belief firmly entrenched in their minds during the early decades of the 20th century anthropologists such as frank speck and amateur historians such as thomas bicknell bricknell were searching new england to identify indians they could gather information from and record the vestiges of a disappearing culture Although they too could not clearly define Indian, these men and their work in some ways actually began the process of dispelling the myth of extension. All right. So, you know, they kept trying to erase these people. These are so called Negro people. All right. And again, we got this image from the other book from our brother. All right. And again, this is 1925 image of the Algonquin Indian Council members, including Thomas Bignell, standing far right. All right. Far right. This guy who was doing the research. He made sure, you know, he told everybody, this ain't a myth, they're still alive. They ain't extinct. I right, let's submit again. They ain't extinct, they're still here. The last full-blood Indians, the Hassan Amisco, these so-called Negro, these colored people, they're still here. 
they're not extinct they're not extinct they're still here all right you see it's happening everywhere all over the the east coast all over the united states all over the americas all right they try to raise the aboriginal i want to read this little expert of from sarah uh cisco the one of the you know the ones who were able to fight and maintain the land and own it and this part of grafton she's quoting uh, what she was researching in her time, she's saying that the records given in the history of Grafton state that the last full-blooded Hassan Amisco Indian died in 1825. All right, so even way back in 1825, and I remember we saw all those newspaper clips, even all the way up to 1930, they're still saying the last Hassan Amisco has died. Look, in 1825, they did that. She's letting you know. They kept saying that. How well, I many years? 100 years. They kept saying that, even probably more. Now it says some of the whites hoping to get control of the land stated that the last full blood had died that year. So it was because they wanted the land, the whites, they wanted the land, this aboriginal, Nipmuc, Hassan Misko Indian, they wanted the land so they kept lying in the newspapers. The last one died. So when people go, don't people don't question it when they take their land because people already believe that the last one already had died anyways. It says Harry Arnold, being tired of their wrangling with him over the land claim, let it go that way thinking that the people who were Indian knew who they were at that time of course history never concerned him trustees of the tribe and agents empowered to conduct its affairs did however take for themselves several acres of the four square miles reserved for Indians leaving the Indians in poor conditions as the years went by and that was Peck that was the guy here in the picture with them right here all the way to the right I uh, he reported that all right so, I mean, look how that is happening so much. They kept reporting and saying, the last Indian died, the last Indian died. And this is a plate, a plate uh, at the old and Indian burial ground in Grafton, recognizing Cisco ancestors dating back to the late 16th century. All right. This is there. And then there's another image here. It says, figure 17, a sign maintained by the town of Grafton continues to mark the Indian burial ground. And it says right here, 1664. All right. All right. So this is another image. All right. So we got another image here. All right. Very important. I just want you to see this as first says figure 18 an intertribal group gathers in front of the Cisco homestead at 1920s gathering for a photograph. All right. So let me just zoom into this picture. All right. Because we're talking about aboriginals. All right. Look at this. Look at this, all right? I know the image, the quality is not that best, but these are all so-called Negroes. All right, all these people will be classified as African-Americans. All right, wrongly classified as black Negroes. All right, you see this image? All right, they were able to maintain their land for all those years. The only land never owned by a white man. It's right here. In this part of Massachusetts, Grafton, I, they were able to hold this little land and make a reservation out of it. You see? No Europeans. All right, I want you to see, wake up, break the spell. These ain't mixed with Africans. These are original yeah. people of this part of the uh, uh, United States. We're talking about aboriginals from this part of the, the states. We're showing you aboriginals from all over. Yeah. All right, Massachusetts ties to the land for many many generations right um definitely gotta acknowledge the indigenous uh heritage all right black people did not only exist in the southeastern united states all right they were all over the the the, the continent of america you see this yeah i mean i just don't know what what else to say and show let them know let them know curimeo I mean, by now, you, <laughs> if you're still talking about African and DNA tests and all this stuff, man, you just choose to be ignorant. Yep. You choose to practice cognitive dissonance. All right. Willful ignorance. You're ignoring facts. You're ignoring true history. Yep. All right. You cannot hide this or erase this. They tried to. How many years to say the last one died? The last one died. The hey, last yeah, one hey, died. Yeah. All these people's ancestors are still alive. Yep. All their offspring are still alive. And today they're probably called African-Americans or black people. All right. 
Negroes, but these are aboriginals of America, of the Nidmuk, Hassanamisko tribe, region, reservation, all right? That they were able to maintain this little piece of land that they were able to maintain. So as these gatherings continued through the 1920s and the following decades up to the present, Figure 18 was likely created at one of the 1920 powwows held each July 4th at the reservation. Although part of this gathering would have included a performance for non-Indian guests, these were less central to Indian identity than the coming together of these connected people at this place. While the reservation and homestead provided what the public and scholars such as Peck, McCulling, and McDelling saw as backdrop, in reality, it was the connecting piece between the past, present, and future for these participants and their descendants. And I want you to know that she very, you know, she's smart. She doesn't mention the word Negro or anything or that they resemble Negro or that, I know these look like Negroes, but she doesn't really talk about that. She don't want you to focus on that. She's just telling you straight up, these are Nidmuk Indians. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, just before I leave this, uh, uh, again, this article contests the places, the history meaning of the Hassan and Misko. All right. Uh, right here it says chapter five and it starts talking about a little bit of the history of this little piece of uh, land how it started and it says in 1654 puritan missionary john elliott all right we got some on him on my hebrew videos he was kept saying how the indians were hebrews mm -hmm. there was no doubt to him he was telling everybody they were the lost tribe yep all right these same people we're talking about and looking at the images now all right Yep. perspective right we're talking about you are the book we're not talking about religions here nope all right all right <laughs> so it says in 1654 puritan missionary john elliott came to the nedmark settlement of hasana Mesit to introduce what he has been referred to as a praying town or a village of praying 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 at the existing nedmark settlement praying indians the boundaries of the praying town covered 8,000 acres of four square miles you hear that 8,000 acres what, what is left today? What is left today? Three acres. Remember, we read that earlier. They only have three acres now. They had 8,000 acres of boundaries of this land they had. All right. Approximately the same area as present-day Grafton. Like, basically, the whole of Grafton was theirs. The Hassan Amisco Reservation is all that remains of 500 acres retained by a handful of Nidmuk families, including Moses Printers. This is the guy who was able to keep the three acres. That lived here following the transfer of 7,500 acres of the praying town land to English settlers in 1727. So out of those 8,000 acres that was basically the whole of Grafton, they only were allowed to keep 500 acres. They gave this, the white European settlers or even just black, white uh, English settlers 7,500 acres, right? They took all of it, all right? Grafton's proprietor records, you can see that. And it was owned by who? We're just talking about that it was owned by aboriginals, right? These people. Their ancestors owned the whole of Grafton. We're talking about so-called Negro people. These ain't Africans. These are aboriginals. You thought Grafton was all white. You thought it was different kinds of Indians. No, this was so-called black lands. Kemet, right? Black lands. Black land. Rich soil. Black soil. Black land. We're talking about a black land. Look at them. Look at these people. All right, where's the mixture? I don't see any mixture. What mixture are you talking about? What do you mean the last Indian died? All right, so they got 8,000, they had 8,000 acres, which was just their boundary, like they, where their families lived, right? Like that's how they measured their uh, whatever plantation or, or their tribal land, right? And they only got to keep 500 originally, and that 500 eventually became three acres only, all right? So it says, 200 years later in 1930, a plague was erected by the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Tercentenary Commission to permanently mark this vestige of Indian land, four and a half acres, according to the plague. It still stands in front of 80 Brigham Hill Road. All right, this is the plague right here. All right, it says Indian Reservation, 1630, 1930. Look, it says these four and one half acres, which out of 8,000, this is all that's left, four acres, four and a half have never belonged to the white man. It's only been owned by the aboriginals, what you will call an African-American today, but these are aboriginals. They owned it, they've been owned it. Having been set aside in 1728 as an Indian reservation, 
by the 40 proprietors who purchased the praying Indian town of Hassan Amesid. I they purchased it from who? They took it away, right? All right, and this image just shows like, um, well, the guy, the land that he, you know, which was the reservation they created was basically the last parcel of land that was owned by this person, Moses, printer Moshe, Moses, a Hebrew name, Moses, printer, all right? And then it goes on to his genealogy. All right, and then we start seeing names we we know in the article, like Lucy Kimby, Heron, uh, Hector Arnold, all right? James Lemel Cisco, the chief, the picture we saw in the other book and the other chief, and his family, right? Cyrus Cisco Bro, who fought for all this and was able to keep the genealogy and fight it and show it and prove it and create the reservation. All right, genealogical chart of the main family members of the printer, Gimby Arnold, Cisco Line, discussed in this dissertation. I right, remember the ancestors. All right. I mean, uh, just, this is just another image. This is the house, basically. This is a 1970s photograph of the Cisco homestead. This, this house, this foundation, this, you know, was there for a lot of years, way before the 1970s, some of the, since the 1800s at least. All right, so there was this was what, what was preserved on this land. All right, it says that she's standing in front of the yard was used as a postcard for visitors and demonstrates Sarah's efforts to ensure its recognition as a culturally important, historically significant structure on an Indian reservation. All right, and now as you can see, this is not no teepee. This is how people lived. They had houses or out of wood, real houses. All right, it was warm. They had fireplaces. All right, they didn't live in teepees. All right. Again, we were just talking about the Hassan Misko Narragansett people. Uh, Nidmuk Narragansett tribal connection here. The Cisco family in the homestead. We're talking about uh, James Lemuel Cisco right here in the middle. His ancestry, that land was owned by them. It was never owned by a white man. These are the people, this is the story. All right, never forget. appropriate just to get a little bit of feel for the history that not a lot of people know about um, in well not a lot of people know about the history of the of uh, the Nipmucks uh, in this area and there was one episode during I guess it was during King Philip's war in the 1670s do you want to tell us a little bit about that caring hands very little um, this is a powwow and this is a joyous occasion because we're this is the first year we have come here to the Kachichuit State Park which is um, our land, and this is this is joyous to be here. Um, uh, the during after well during the King Philip Wars when uh, Deer Island had existed, the Natick Indians were taken in their entirety and placed on Deer Island, as was then uh, the Ponkapog Indians, which is uh, Ponkapog is Stoughton Canton, which is where we live also presently, Littleton, and we're Natick's. We consider ourselves Natick's. With Natick's are a combination of. Uh, the Nipmuc, the Massachusetts, some Wampanoag, various tribes, so that we consider ourselves Natick Indians. Now, on October 24th, there is going to be a, um, a, a ceremony out at Deer Island um, where we will remember this, and, and uh, it'll begin in Natick, and it'll end there.
but yeah, thanks for tuning. That was the bonus little video I had there. Just wanted to go ahead and uh, show that. We're going to go out with a banger here. Shout out to Alman Deliman for the beat. This is a classic. <laughs> All right, we're going to get the vibes up. Get up and dance if you want to. Honor the, the ancestors. And uh, just jam because, you know, uh, 2024, you know, uh, you, you know, big things going to happen. Big things coming. Big things going to happen. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Take care. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Wow, wow. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah.
Awa.